So there's no way we can stop on uh, Surat Al-Kahf without really kind of taking a kind of holistic approach. This is the surah the Prophet wasallam told all of us to read on the night and day of Jumu'ah. So this night and then tomorrow is the night you read Surah Al-Kahf. And it just happened to be in, in the Qira'ah it came in the middle of Ramadan and so forth. So a lot of people over the years have asked me many times, what's the big deal about Surah Al-Kahf? Because he could have picked any surah in the Qur'an. The Prophet ﷺ is musharra'. He was sent as a legislator of the most important ways to, and the best ways to practice this faith. And so we have to ask ourselves, what is the whole story about? It is about the theme of preserving faith through the struggles of life, through a connection to revelation, and believers who will support you in that process. That is literally the whole story. And what is Jumu'ah? It's whenever we are going to come together as believers, right? And it's when we're going to share revelation in the khutbah and the teachings, and it's where we come together away from a society that has all its fitan and struggles and all of that, and that's where we build that bond. And that is exactly the theme of Surat Al-Kahf. And so it starts out at the very beginning telling you the first key to your success is reliable revelation that is clear and preserved and something that you can live by. Then it goes into the story of these young sleepers. And if you notice at the end of the story, how does Allah treat, were they five, six, seven, or eight? Is that important to Allah? Actually, Allah demeaned that nitpicky, oh, it was this year, or that Sahabi's name, or this, uh, you know, ruling of this particular thing. We have to see things in a big picture as believers. We have to see the whole Qur'an as one document. We have to see the whole seerah as one experience. We have to see our whole reality as a very diverse, multi-layered group of people living in this country of America, as Harun pointed out earlier. We have to see that in the big picture. Not just, okay, I'm going to go to the masjid and pray some salah, get my rewards and leave. That's not the point. That's not what we're doing here. That's not what the surah is teaching us. So these sleepers, what were they actually doing? They were struggling with fitna in their community. And the fitna even was within the religious elders among them. And so they said, look, we have these scriptures. Let's just get away from here and go be in a place where we can preserve our faith. So it was young men, generally knowledgeable that we have that. And they have their dog with them who is protecting them. And so the message is, to take yourself with the believers holding on to scripture. That's the, that's the, that's the what we call allusion, not illusion, allusion in English literary term, terminology. So then he comes after that, وَصْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِيُّ يُرِيدُ الْوَاتِ Then he firmly puts down the point after he gave you a whole story about how that happened in one time in history. And the miraculous part of that is that this was the answer when the Jews were trying to help the Quraysh to prove the Prophet was a false prophet, they asked him about three questions, and one of them being, who were these people which they themselves are very confused about, as Allah said. In their writings, they're very confused about what, what happened and who was it. Actually, some people say the Dead Sea Scrolls was actually what they were preserving. Wallah alam, but this is just a, an opinion. It's important to, when we say that we have Ahl al-Kitab, right? And we live in their country where we're a small minority. We're going to have to relate to them and understand to them and understand where they're coming from and how, where we come from and how to work together. Ta'alo ila kalimatin sawa'in baynana wa baynakum, right? And so then he tells us, wasbir nafsaka, be patient, perseverant, have fortitude along with those other people who've committed themselves day and night, not periodically once a month, once a week, once a month, once a year, but those people who've committed themselves. That's why when you come to a congregational prayer, and by the way, the sunnah is as we're trying to revive here, inshallah, it will come, that ladies and men came to the sunnah, came to the daily prayers of uh, Fajr and Isha for sure, and oftentimes in Dhuhr, Asr and Maghrib. And so when you're coming, it's not just to come as salamu alaykum and then leave. You should get to know people. You should share numbers. You should invite people to your home. We should find out about what kind of things are going on, what, what people need help. 
whose skill set might help this person's situation out. That's where the collective of the believers share in their values. And so that's what the ayah is commanding us to do. And never turn away from the believers who are fully dedicated, saying, oh, you know, I have these worldly obligations that I have to do. Or, you know, this is this person that I'm, you know, close with. I can't leave that relationship. You cannot be best friends with, a strong, with, with someone who's not a believer if you are a strong believer. You just simply can't. You can be an acquaintance and a friend and a good uh, influence, but you can't spend a lot of your time with someone who's not serious about faith because as the Prophet ﷺ warned us and also praised us, A person will truly be affected by the religious convictions and beliefs of their close friends. So pay attention who you take as your close friends. But the mosque is the place where brothers and sisters who find people that they can share time with and knowledge with and love with that is a very beautiful thing. And that's what we're supposed to do here. So I just want to conclude uh, with two more quick points, inshallah. And that is the al-mal wal banoon, zinatul hayat al-dunya. Wealth and family and progeny and all of the beauty that comes with all of that, it's enjoyable. And it doesn't make all wealth haram. It doesn't mean we're supposed to live as monks. It doesn't mean it's haram to have a big family. Well, those things are fine. But the question is, for which purpose are you engaging these worldly matters? Are you doing those in light of Allah Azza wa Jal? Or are you doing those in light of an attachment to something other than Him? The creator of those things. So that's why he then concludes after that, وَالْبَاقِيَاتُ الصَّالِحَاتُ خَيْرٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّكَ ثَوَابًا وَخَيْرٌ أَمَلًا That those actions that you commit yourself to, that will lead to an eternal value in your scale of deeds that will be weighed out based upon your claim to faith and the intentions behind it, that will be eternal. So whatever wealth and whatever family connections you have that are not helping you to grow in your faith and that are not you producing the goodness of faith in the world, then you should rethink your situation. You should definitely reassess who you are, what you're about, and what you're planning for because death comes like that to so many people and nobody's ready for it. And so we have to think. And in one hadith, it was mentioned that al-baqiyatu salihat are what? Hmm? Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha Allah, Allahu Akbar, wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Now somebody might say that sounds superficial. It's only if you understand what the purpose of dhikr is. Divine remembrance is about a heart coming back to that spiritual purpose that gave the heart its beating purpose in the first place. That gave the mind the ability to rationalize anything. And that is the spiritual force that causes creation and gives it meaning and purpose. So when you are saying, glory be to the perfection of my creator, when you say all praise and gratitude are due to my Creator, when you say all of everything that matters is that there is one deity and nothing worthy of worship beside Him, and He is greater than all things that exist because He is the source of all things. And so know that nothing can happen, no capacity, no will, no strength, no power is existing except for through and by Him. When you recognize the value of these statements and they come from your heart with meaning, whatever's going on will be smooth trails. It will be a very easy life. The believers, when they remember God, they are at a state of peace and contentment. And the last point I want to bring is the story of Khidr and Moses, peace and blessings be upon him. Moses, alayhi salatu was salam, He's naturally empowered and excited and happy to have been given all these blessings of revelation and knowledge and wisdom. And so he started to posit that I am the one who knows most on this earth. And he's the great messenger that Allah has sent to save the Israelites, whom Allah had preferred and chosen over all nations, as is mentioned like four times in the Quran. And so then Allah said, no, Moses, I have some lessons for you to learn. He says, okay, Ya Rabb. He says, just go travel. Towards the sunset, and then we'll see, you will meet someone that can teach you. Right? Atayna abadam min ibadina, atayna hu rahmatam min indina, wa alamna hu min laduna ilma. So, in this situation, I'm not going to go too much because I've gone a little bit over time, but what I'll say is, we learn a vast story that starts with 
if you want to be on the spiritual path, you must never allow your religiosity, your knowledge, your practice to ever make you think you're better than anyone else. Humility is the key to everything. Why? Because it's the exact opposite of that which deviated from Islam in the first place, which was Shaitan who said, Ana khayru minhu khalaqtani minna wa khalaqtahu min I'm better than Adam. This thing you made of dirt. I come from fire. I came before. I'm better. I know. I'm right. So humility is the key to the spiritual path, to the path of true morality. Then you have to have the curiosity and the willingness to seek knowledge, to grow and learn. And then when you seek that knowledge, you will find that there are people who know things much more than you and have spent a whole lot of time and you must respect them. You must respect. There's a difference between blind following and respect. Because everybody has something to learn, even those of the greatest of knowledge. Above any, all of the people who have knowledge, there's always someone that will one-up them. And they should always be waiting to see that that's the person in front of me, as we started the story here. So we have to respect people of knowledge, and we keep asking and we keep learning, and then we'll reach that beautiful thing, wisdom. And wisdom is something that is not found easily. It's hardship. You feel so strongly that this is what it should be from my experience, from my limited knowledge. And so what we learned in this story is that Moses realized he ver knows very little about the depth and the wisdom of divine purpose in its actual application in the world. So may Allah guide us to have that humility, to have a deeper sense of knowledge, to yearn and be curious to seek more knowledge, and to have that respect for the scholars, and then to attain that beautiful wisdom of which وَمَا يُؤْتَ الْحُكْمَةِ فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا So may Allah bless us all. Jazakum Allah khair. We'll continue with the tarawih.